Great question. What belongs to Caesar and what belongs to God? So we are at that point in the gospel where there is a peak of conflict going on. If you recall, previous three Sundays, we had Jesus on the offensive. He was attacking, like Notre Dame did last night. And one of the parables was two sons. One said yes, one said no. It was evident he was saying this to his, the Pharisees and the scribes and so on, who were not saying yes to him. And the next parable talked about a king who had a vineyard and he sent his workers there and the people running the vineyard killed the messengers and eventually killed the son. Again, it was directed right at the religious leaders who were not accepting the message. And then the final one was the wedding banquet. The king invited everybody to a wedding banquet. They all had excuses. Don't want to go, this and that. So finally, he sent his son, killed him, and then he invited everybody, that's us, from the highways and the byways. So in every instance, Jesus is on the offensive. Remember, and before this, he cleaned out the temple. Somebody that cleans your room can really make you furious if you don't want it. Uh, so this is a mounting thing. So what happens? In the gospel, it's, it's wonderfully written. So let's take a look at the text itself. It starts out by saying, the Pharisees went off. That's called wimps. They went off. In other words, they said, well, mm, <clears throat> let's go talk about this privately to see what we can do because he's too good on his feet and he's threatening. So they went off and they plotted how they might ensnare him or trap him. That's the same word they use in order to trap animals that they're trying to hunt and kill. It's the very same word that's used at that time. They sent their disciples to him. Wimp doubled. They, they didn't go themselves. They said, you, 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 you go and ask him this question. So he really had a presence that was intimidating, at least to them. And whom did they go with? The disciples of the Pharisees went with the Herodians. This is a classic example of an unholy alliance. The Pharisees were the ones that defended the tradition and the law. The Herodians were in cahoots with the Roman power and the occupying. The two of them together, are you kidding? But sometimes politics, well, at any rate, <laughs> the two of them come together and they're gonna confront Jesus. And they start out by saying to him, uh, teacher, I don't know if you know this, but in the Gospel of Matthew, anytime teacher, the word teacher, is used, I like the word teacher, but here it's, it's always someone who's a not, not a believer. So anytime you read the Gospel of Matthew, you see someone uh, called teacher, that means they don't respect him. And then he says, we know that you're a truth man. Yeah, a very truthful man. Took him to the cross. And then they ask the question, do you pay the taxes to Caesar or not? It's obviously a problem because if he says don't pay the taxes, then it's sedition, he could be crucified by the Romans, which some of them would like. If he said uh, do pay the taxes, he would lose the support that he had from all the people and so on. So it looked like he was in a tough spot. But notice it says, knowing their malice, and he calls them hypocrites, show me the coin that pays the tax. That's a special coin. The coin that pays the tax was minted by the Romans. And it had not only an image, remember graven images are forbidden for Jews. It not only had an image of Caesar, but it had this inscription. Let me read the inscription to you. They have, they have copies of these coins. Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus, high priest. Well, that was idolatry, flat out. And after 70 AD, when the temple was destroyed, it was very clear the Jews had to pay a temple tax, but they also paid a tax if they did this. They paid it for some type of shrine in, in, in Rome, probably the shrine of Jupiter. So it was a double bad situation for a Jew to even do this. It goes on, it says, whose image? 
He asks the question, as soon as Jesus says, whose image? Any devout Jew knows that they are made in the image of God. It goes right back to Genesis. We are made in God's image. First and foremost, that is who we are. We're created in God's image, and we have responsibility for all of creation. So that all clicks off. And, and the very first reading is chosen, too, to show that, that, in fact, even though Cyrus didn't know that he was under the influence of God doing the good thing that he did, uh, he did the good thing. So even emperors, Cyrus, in the first reading, did a good thing, and God was actually influencing him. And then he says to them, finally, pay, repay Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. Okay, so it's a great gospel, and it has a lot of stuff in it that uh, is worth paying attention to, but the two big questions really are. The first one is the question of what do we owe our country? What do we owe, if you will, Caesar? Um, in this situation, Caesar made himself out to be God. We don't have presidents. We shouldn't have presidents to make themselves out to be God. But here, we enter into what has been in our tradition, the separation of church and state. In the middle of the 17th century, one of the first settlers in the United States, Roger Williams, spoke about the wall of separation. He was a big advocate of religious freedom in this country. And Thomas Jefferson picked up on that and used that phrase, the wall of separation. And it's been a constant kind of conflict, back and forth, religious freedom and so on and so forth. It goes on today. There are lots of examples you could mention, I could mention right in the press. But the idea of the separation is never airtight. It can't be. It can't be. I mean, if you, if you believe something very deeply and it's the essence of who you are, you can't keep it private. You shouldn't. Will you? If you do, you'll explode. So somewhere along the line, it's got to have some influence. At the same time, I think it'd probably be wiser to make the relationship of church and state not as a wall of separation, but as a distinction, an important distinction. Listen to this. President Washington, in his farewell address, said this. Reason and experience both forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. Which is to say, if we're gonna hold things together, it's not just enough to have laws, you have to have virtue to be able to follow the laws. Choice is not paramount, character is. Because if you have choice but no character, you have disaster. So what's going on here is, in President Washington's view, is that there has to be some moral formation rooted religiously. That was his comment. There, uh, the rabbis also had a very interesting statement. It read, I, I found this the other day. It says, pray for the peace of the ruling power, since but for fear of it, people would have swallowed up each other alive. <laughs> One of the roles of government is to keep the peace, to prevent crime, murder, to try to provide some type of social welfare and so on. So the first thing is this business of church and state. I've been in churches like this one <laughs> that has a flag of the United States and a papal flag. In my view, for what it's worth, Cambria, sorry, my view, we should at least have them at different levels. Different levels. Because we are a people that are pledged to be patriotic. We have to be patriotic. We should. We should love our country. Our country has given us a great deal but not nationalism, my country right or wrong. There's a difference. And I think it's the kind of thing if we don't pay attention to, we run into real difficulty. Remember, the Nuremberg trials after World War II recognized this. Just because someone in your military says you do this and you have an order, therefore you have to follow it, my boss told me to do it. No, you, don't. you have a higher boss, your conscience. And that's from your encounter with God. So there's a dimension here that transcends the state or transcends the country. We're not just US citizens. We're not just continental. As I like to say, we're global. 
as Catholics. And that's an important part of our, our life. I, I've been told to avoid politics in the pulpit. And coming here this morning on NPR, I considered it a divine intervention where they were talking about the NFL and whether to kneel, whether not to kneel, take the knee, all this kind of stuff. Well, you think I'm going to go into that? Are you kidding? But I do want to say this. Whether people stand or kneel, so on, I think it creates a distraction. From what? From the most important thing. I would love to see the NFL players who make terrific salaries donate a percentage of it, 5%, all of them, since most of them have come from backgrounds where they didn't have good education chances to support education for kids who are not getting good education. Create a big fund. That's, that's serious. That's going to, that costs something. That's important. I'd love to see that happen. I would take that very seriously because you'd see that they're walking the talk. And some of them do that. Some of them are involved in those charities and that would be very important. So let's be careful about the separation of church and state. It's not church and state, it's church and state. Second and final point, taxes. You might say, Father, you should shut up because you don't pay taxes. <laughs> Wrong, I do. I have to pay taxes on what USC pays me, all right? Just, just for the record, somebody brought this up earlier. So I pay taxes on that. But I think we have to face some, some realities here. What is it that we pay the tax for? If we pay the tax to God, what is it? We live in a culture, as one author put it rather well, that easily divides the world into three parts. First, as much as I can get from me and mine. Second, as little as possible for Caesar. And third, oh yes, as much as might be left over for God. <laughs> it's not really funny, but it's a little painful to hear it. So what is it that we owe to God? I mean, taxes are always a sensitive issue. Well, we owe prayer. We owe our fathers. We owe Hail Marys. We need, owe the sign of the cross. We owe the building of the church, keeping it up, all of that. That's all good, and that's important. But we owe more than that. And what we owe is the recognition that everything belongs to God. And as long as there are homeless people, refugees, sex trafficking, people without food, drinkable water, people in nursing homes and in prisons, whom no one visits, we need not to rest. If everyone is created in God's image and likeness, we need to treat everyone with that degree of respect. And that often means attending to their needs, and not just their physical needs, but the needs that they have as people, as people that need friendship and support. Jesus spoke truth to power. It's not easy. For us to pay the taxes we owe to God is demanding, and there's no rest. But we ought to be consoled that God does not ask us to do it alone, has given us Jesus in the flesh and now in the sacrament to accompany us throughout this effort. And that, indeed, is good news.